I needed the microphone. You didn't hear me. Pat has a special announcement, except this one's really special. He's not dead. Pat had a heart attack not too long ago, and we almost lost Pat. Pat, stand up and tell us what's up, man. I'm feeling fine. I uh, am essentially just a um, victim of the fact that genetics and stress very often trump lifestyle when it comes to the heart. And even though I was living a great lifestyle, a very clean lifestyle, and uh, my body was otherwise in great shape, it just doesn't burn up bad cholesterol the way that it does in most folks. So I uh, have a, a heart problem. And uh, in 2008, a couple of stents installed because a couple of cardiologists thought I was going to die on this real quick. But I mean, just had a heart attack. And, and then on uh, March 31st, one of those stents closed up. Stents have their own risks. So one of the stents closed up, and I was working out with this gentleman right As a matter of fact, I'd, I'd like to say, a special thank you to my friend Troy here. He, this man saved my life right here. Most, most of my life I've been working out by myself. And uh, that day, uh, Troy and I just started working out together a few months ago. And that day, Troy and I were working out. And because of the stars aligned, I'm not going to bore you with the details, the stars aligned so that if you're going to have a heart attack, uh, the greatest thing you can do is have a heart attack when you're in a doctor's office and certain things aligned so that I was in a doctor's office when I finally flatlined. I flatlined twice, and maybe a third time in the ambulance. But um, I'm feeling fine. I'm working out. I can start uh, eating workouts in about, uh, a couple, in about a week. And I really feel great. And thank you very much for your uh, concern and support. I appreciate it. Do you have something, Keith? No, sir. Just right. gotta get some more first shot. You look pretty. <laughs> you look pretty, though. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah, you know the tradition. We gotta sing, suck it up. Wow. <laughs> sing it. Uh, you know, I just, I, you know, some of these old classics, I, you know, let's do America the Beautiful just because I feel patriotic today after seeing Keith's shirt. <laughs> oh, beautiful, for spacious skies, for amber waves of rain, for purple mountains, majesty above the fruited plains. America, America, God shed. I, um, um, brotherhood, that reminds me. I went to the city of brotherly love, um, Philadelphia, a few weeks ago for Fedstock 2. And it was a concert. What they had done is they had a, a parade float, and they had it all decorated and everything, and the bed and all that kind of stuff. And what had happened is they, I don't know how they got permission for this or if they even asked, but. Um, in downtown Philadelphia, you have the Con Center, and then on the other side there's Independence Hall and the Liberty Bells there and all that kind of stuff. Right across the street from it is uh, the public television station, and it has like one of those big ticker tape kind of LED things that go. And while it's saying, you know, right was when they started doing the ground invasion into Libya. And I'm taking a little movie of it with my droid, you know, kind of, yeah, dude. And you go, and there's the Federal Reserve right there, okay? So they have the big Federal Reserve uh, branch there, bank, whatever it is. And um, they take, and they had uh, Jordan Page playing guitar and doing his protest songs and such, and he does a really great job. And uh, they pulled it up right in front of the Fed. I mean, the doors were like right there, all right? So the sick curb, there's a sidewalk, and there's the Fed. And then all the guys with their, you know, s sniper scopes, you know, <laughs> come out around, and we're standing there giving our speeches to 100 people and the Federal Reserve right there. Then we went downtown 
uh, Philadelphia for about three miles around downtown Saturday and then wound up at a place called Buffalo Billiards where we had another concert and fun and vendors and all that kind of stuff. So it was fed stock, you know, it was like a you know, band thing. But uh, <clears throat> they, they're really nice to us and uh, I was a featured speaker and had beautiful programs and uh, just oozed all over Freedom's Phoenix and so on. Well, when I got up to give my speech, I already had it all planned and so on. When I got up and I saw the average age, it was probably at least 20 to 30 years younger than the average age in this room. I'll bet you the average age could have easily been 26, 27. All right. Young people. Now, it, a lot of it, of course, was, you know, Levolution stuff. You know, they came there, you know, for the Levolution kind of thing. But uh, that, the Levolution's not dead. I mean, it's just, it, this is, <coughs> how many of you saw the debate? Gee, I wonder who won, you know? <laughs> you know, the, the, <coughs> you know the, the thing is, is that we had before where there were hundreds, maybe thousands, as time went on, tens of thousands. They're starting off the speaking tour of 2012 with hundreds of thousands. And I know a lot of people, it was four years ago, almost exactly four years ago, I'm here going, you guys have no idea what's coming. I mean, some of you may remember. And I go, yeah, you guys think you do, but you don't. This is going to be much bigger than you guys think. Name, you know, I won't give their names, but initials come to mind, like Alan Corwin. So the thing is that <laughs> the whole point is, is that there was something down here that a lot of people, certainly that are involved in traditional politics, that deal with the media, that have the perspective of giving a crap what Channel 5, 12, and the Arizona Republic says. We have shifted an entire media to whatever the heck they say, to whatever you say. In a couple of weeks, we are releasing our first magazine online that's for tablets for Freedoms Phoenix. I just got confirmation uh, day before yesterday that Dr. Paul is going to write a, a column for our inaugural edition. So that... Yeah, to start this off, so that, along with a bunch of other great people, you know, hardcore, no compromise people, is going to be the nucleus of this magazine. So we're in the middle of all this now. I'm dealing with Adobe. And those. But uh, the software on this is just $2,600 It's twenty six hundred dollars just for the software to make the magazine. So this is a big endeavor. What happens is these tablets that are starting, like iPads and the Zooms and so on, you just flip through a magazine, interactive, video, audio, swirling, turning, doing, whatever, and it's going to be downloadable, subscriptions, all this kind of stuff. We have been working on this for almost a month. It is going to be very cool, and it's the next generation of media, because everything that we've done, the radio, the videos, 4409 stuff, the Love Evolution, everything, is now being brought into these tablets and to go on the droids. You know, I mean, it's just, these things are amazing. So I'm going, okay, we're going to be one of the first. The software just became publicly available Tuesday. And we were already in beta testing this, ready to go. Now, we, after my money, I'm sitting there going, it's been 72 hours, I don't have my download. Where's my download? Come on. Adobe. You know, so that's been interesting. I sent a conversation to Pal. I just... I sent a picture of Peggy back there. I know. He goes, he goes, he just sent me this big picture. You know, my name, Peggy. <laughs> That's who I've been dealing with. <clears throat> so, so this is a whole new medium that we're starting the next phase of this evolution. Those that did not understand, that didn't believe, that couldn't comprehend what was coming, I am here to tell you, it is going to be factors of that this way. You can't comprehend it, I can't comprehend it, because you don't know what a 15-year-old with a droid can do. You don't know. You know. Think about it. Right now, I pull this out, I go like this, I push this button. It says quit. I go boom, like that, it automatically records. 
stops, cop takes it, smashes it, whatever. It's already up on the web on my own site, you know, for everybody to see. And everybody that's subscribed, they get it right then as I'm getting the crap beat out of me. This faces or anything? Can you do that again? Well, I tell you, that's another thing a lot of people don't know. Every face that you put on my daughter, she loaded, this is just last week, she loaded up a bunch of pictures of her girlfriends that were out doing whatever. Instantaneously, Facebook came back with a list of names, named them all, and then you just select to confirm that that was the right name from facial recognition. Yeah. No, this is not later. This is not, and if you know they have this on Facebook, how long have they had this stuff before? Right after 9-11, what did they do? They went into, they had the Super Bowl, and everybody that walked in, bleep, 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 bleep terrorist, you know, whatever. Okay? This has been going on since 03 or something. This is, it's getting interesting. We just sent, Donna sent a bunch of uh, DVDs, and Cato Institute sent me a translation of the Declaration of Independence, Constitution, and Bill of Rights in English and Arabic. I took a, we put little mailing labels on the Constitution part that says, uh, we tried this, maybe you can do better. <laughs> I'm not endorsing that, man. I'm going to say, hey, go do what we did. How'd that work out for us? So what we did is we sent those. It just, a, I mean, a package, how big was the package? 200 bucks. Man, you better freaking use them, man. I ain't doing that again. They go paid. But what happened, Alexandria, Egypt is where this went. When we started the Haria Phoenix, which is Freedom's Phoenix in Arabic, you hit a translate button on the site, and it translates everything to Arabic. We have 30 languages that we can do Freedom's Phoenix in right now. When we hit Arabic, we also created an Arabic version of Facebook and Twitter. Within a few weeks, we had 2,300 people signed up for our Twitter account. It got canceled, suspended. They never tell you. And that's and we knew from experience, you go in and you're just in the la la land, they're never going. So we just started it up again, boom, we're six, seven hundred of the better guys. So you know it's known down, which is cool. These people that read, we take anything that has to do with the Middle East, Libya, Gaddafi, foreign policy, <coughs> anything that is of interest, we would think, to someone in the Middle East, we put it into that special category, then tweet in Facebook the translated URL, the Google Translate, it translates it all, you just see it, it goes, Arabic. Every link from there is Arabic. Every post you do, Arabic. Okay? So all that has been going to the Middle East, and what has been the focus? The video has the International Society for Individual Liberty, ISIL. Ken Schoolin, the guy that does Philosophy of Liberty, the black with the stick animation, you guys ever see that? You know, it's a Philosophy of Liberty. Well, it's translated in a bunch of languages, but it wasn't done into Arabic. And I'm like, what the hell, man? He goes, well, it's hard, you know, the font, and it's right, left, and it's all that. So finally, we hooked up with a guy out of Moscow that works with them. And he was in Azerbaijan, and went back to here, and got Canada, and Hawaii, and that within 10 days, we had translated into Arabic. We put it into a, what's called a PAL format, so it plays in their DVDs there, made hundreds of copies, sent it to Alexandria, Egypt, one of the guests that I had from um, uh, Egypt on, and the bloggers and the activists there are getting this stuff right now. We translated the bouquet of flowers guy, we know the truth, we know the truth in Arabic. All this while the State Department's wanting to meet with rebel leaders, blah, 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 blah. No, they're not. They're wanting to control them. And what happens when you have the American Revolution goes worldwide, which it already has. That logo was done by an artist called Banksy. He was one of the Oscar nominee uh, for a documentary that thought Oprah Winfrey is introducing the film. I didn't know that was the guy until they did this. I saw this film. Donna and Gina Hess were watching. He called me and Barry, and come on, you got to see this. Boom, there's that logo. And I go, that guy called me about a year ago. He's secret. Nobody knows who he is. He called me about a year and a half ago saying, hey, man, I love what you guys are doing with the logo. Oh, cool, thanks. You did that? Yeah, right on. I had no idea this guy was famous. When he does graffiti, they have to go and paint over it. The cities do. Because whenever they find it, it's like a treasure hunt. They go out with big saws and they cut concrete out and sell it on eBay for $100,000. <laughs> you think I'm kidding, man. This is, this, and this is big. So I go, all right. So when they're throwing out in Cairo, I know they need this logo. Translated it, sent it over. 
while the State Department and Hillary and all these guys and the neo Obamas, whatever the heck they are, they're trying to control the Middle East and change all the dictators and reinsert the new ones with a shiny tie, little younger and hipper, and got his droid out. Yeah, man, I'm one of you. I'll rule you high techly. Okay? <laughs> what happens when an entire generation realizes that they own themselves? That's what all this stuff is about. It's about self ownership. You don't need Pharaoh number 473. Okay? You are your own Pharaoh. What happens when you get youth? I tell you, before we get, we'll get to this in just a second. I want to give you just one statistic. And I'm sure, I, hopefully, I shared it with a lot of you last time. Egypt has 80 million people. 17 to 20 million of them are in the Cairo area. The rest are in the Nile Valley, a small area. The rest of it, you know, Sahara Desert. What happened was you had this concentration of people. And I looked at the demographics from the CIA fact book thing online. Only 5% of the people are over 65. 33% of the entire population is 14 years of age or younger. The average age in Egypt is 24. You cannot get away from this demographic. 40% of the people live on less than $4 a day. When food went up 120-something percent a few months ago, heck, it's probably more than that now, you have all the staples, all the commodities shooting up because of our Federal Reserve and World Banking, De La Whatever, they are starving. That's why during the debate, Ron Paul says, oh, people vote from their bellies. They're be, they be hungry. Why do you think we have 45 million people on food stamps here in the United States out of 300 million people? I'm going, these, dem these numbers you cannot get away from. When the people were rising up in Tunisia, I knew something because this was not because why did they do that? A guy couldn't, they wouldn't allow him to sell fruit to sustain himself, so he sat out in front of their city hall, they kicked him out of asking for a license permission, and he doused himself with lighter fluid and lit himself on fire. That literally sparked the Middle East Revolution. That was the beginning. Egypt, same thing, economics. Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Syria, Iran, Jordan. Somalia, everywhere, and they're not able to contain it. Greece right now has announced they want to break out of the uh, European Union. So then, after they got the money, of course. But they, <laughs> <laughs> so we're looking at a worldwide revolution. Because of our experiences over here and the impact that we were able to have on the youth and how they're manifesting themselves and their preferences and understanding that, you're still voting? I mean, a lot of these guys are like, you know, yeah, we're past that. We support Ron Paul, we'll do yeehaw and go out, and that's the message. But, you know, they know better from firsthand experience going to the precinct committee, you know, meetings, and the chin. Don't even start with me, Karen. <laughs> Karen Winfield, uh, you may know Karen. She's Sylvia Allen's um, secretary assistant, and she was for Karen Johnson for years. So she's one of the good guys. But even Karen will know exactly what I'm talking about. If you think you're going to vote yourself free, you have not been paying attention. Okay? So this is the situation that we're in now. The government shut down the Internet whenever it served their purposes throughout all of these conflicts. To think they won't do it here is to be naive. In the mid-90s, when they, we first started doing Internet, and heck, I think I knew Tim back then. Tim Weaver has been you know, a, a gun activist for a long time. For years, he had a... Uh, uh, outfit called Practical Tactical that, you know, everything but ammo and guns, you know, all the accoutrement, got a lot of cool stuff. And we did a lot. Of, he ran for mayor against uh, uh, Lane Scruggs in Glendale. We had a lot of fun with that back in the day. And so, so we've, you know, done some activism together. He's Republican, but I mean, we can't have fun. So during this process, we knew that they could flip it off whenever they wanted. During the mid-90s, you did what was called alt groups, alt.news slash gun rights or alt that whatever, and it was more like a directly online on servers on the uh, DOD internet. You would be able to go in and type it. If you knew how to do the DOS coding or whatever Linux crap, you go in there and you put your name, boom, everything you ever wrote ever on the internet was right there. This is 1994. <laughs> we knew that they were trying. Oh, Facebook is doing things. They're like, oh, how are you been, man? They've been doing this since forever. So what happened is, you know, look it off, right? Absolutely they can. 
Oh, they could never. Oh, the heck, they can't. I remember it was Libya in 03, the entire country got flipped off. Any of you guys remember that? They were mad at Gaddafi for something. They just turned off the internet. I was doing radio. I go, well, if they can turn off an entire country over there, guess what? So this is uh, the mindset that we're in. How do we communicate when they flip off what we've become so dependent on for everything? Even back then, we were thinking, you know what we could do? We could use ham radio. They call it packet radio. You transmit data digitally. It's received. It's email using ham radio. It's good to know. We'll just keep that over here. So that technology has advanced a little bit. But I have a card. I go, who is somebody that I know that uses these systems in training, you know, and doing their Second Amendment stuff and camping and going out? Who, who knows this? Who works with some people? And I thought of Tim. So I go, Tim, can you please come and just give us a, an overview, an understanding of the radio options of communications other than cell phone towers, other than licensed commercial radio television, we got it, other than Department of Defense Internet. Is there some way that citizens can use radio waves to communicate when things get really bad? They're going to get really bad. This I know. Now, there's a lot of good that can come from that. Certainly now that we have a foundation and the confidence that we knew we were right. That we're going into, you know, just being able to barter and trade. And you meet and you get somebody and who has what. And you kind of networking of just neighbors. And not, not necessarily in a geographic area, but in a philosophical area. That's already happened. And that was the point I was making at my speech in Fedstock. It's great that we come together because you don't need to know who you can spend the time in the bunker with. Who's got the strong back? Who can plow and who can feed themselves? Because it, you know everybody's going to need the, the network. But you know, if you're a drain, you, know, you better have been really nice to me for a long time because my dog rates above you. <laughs> Until I'm hungry and then he's food. <laughs> So Tim Weaver, go ahead and come on, uh, come on up. Tim Weaver, give him a round of applause. He's been a good activist for a long time, and he's going to help us understand what we can do. Oh yeah, this gun map thing. Tell us about this, Alan, real quick. Uh, train the Arizona program that you guys know about, where we got billboards up to say "Gun Save Lives." Uh, welcome to Arizona. Learn to shoot straight. We got these on the highways. The organization put together a gun map. This is where you can go shooting in Arizona. Oh, nice. Three feet by two feet. I've got maybe a half a dozen of them here. Let me also mention there's a table over there with gun magazines, not ammo magazines, printed magazines, uh, that you won't see anywhere else. Shot show business, gun store retailer, <coughs> some radical literature that Ernie would consider very moderate. But <laughs> They're free, there's some Heritage Foundation stuff. They're free, please take them. I don't want to carry them home, I'm trying to circulate them around. And Powell got one copy of each of my three new books. I came out with three books since last I was here. And I'd like them back at some point. Oh, yeah. they're circulating. <laughs> uh, yeah. Thank you for the time reading this. After you shoot, your gun's hot, the perp's not, now what? There's uh, you want to know? There's a 64 nation worldwide gun owner's guide. You'll find a lot of interesting things. What do you do right after shooting? Call 911? No. And record a statement to the people who are trying to convict you of murder? Very Maybe not the best idea. There's some stuff in that. Um, then there's a 64 nation worldwide gun owner's guide. 64 nations. And the bottom line on that is we are not the only gun friendly nation. Every nation in the world has gun stores, gun ranges, shooting enthusiasts. They buy and sell ammo and firearms. A lot of more tyrannical. We ranked them all. We came in ninth. Ninth. Oh, wow. So that's the blue one. And Who's number one? one? I brought a few. And uh, what was the other? Who's oh, number, one? Who's yeah. number one? Get five bucks. Mm -hmm. Get five bucks. Ernie, uh, Ernie will appreciate this. Yesterday I picked up my 13th book at the place. So this is the first place it's been exposed to the public. This is about all the things you're not allowed to say anymore. Mm -hmm. I'll preface this by saying, how does every race joke start? Oh, I'm not a racist. <laughs> you can't tell jokes. You can't say things on the job. You're under every kind of restriction, and you watch your speech. This one's called Bomb Jokes at Airports. And 180 
86 other things you better not say, because you can end up fined, filed, arrested, dead, depending on what you say. So thank you, Ernie. And well, who was number one? Who's number one? Yeah, and who's number two? Who's number eight? It's in the book. <laughs> and not everybody agrees on the rankings, but where do you take a look? I mean, there are places where you can buy an RPG at retail. And this is just, you wouldn't want to live in some of these places, but this is just strictly access to firearms. You want belt fed, water cooled, at a good price, you can't buy that here. Um, I'm going to get a drink before Tim starts, is that okay? Here's the map if you want to pass that around, I'll be right back. This, this is a, this is like a road map, it's just an Arizona map, but it shows all of the places that you can go shooting. You know, and which is becoming more and more, you know, I need a map. <laughs> it's like there's not enough desert anymore. Yeah. That's exclusive to high schools in China. Yeah, don't call. So what we're going to do is go ahead and just start. Let's go ahead and start with Tim and give him our attention because this is information that I, I really am looking forward to. At the end of it, I have 10 packets here that have this. Did you add any? I, I did add the graphics. Um, Ernie, I downloaded a copy to Ernie's computer, so if you email Ernie, say you want a copy of the presentation, he can email that to you. It's about one and a half meg, so make sure that you have an email address that can accept a file that large. Oh, okay. Um, everybody hear me all right? All right, um, actually, Ernie, I'm from the Libertarian wing of the Republican Party, so I'm quasi-converted. <laughs> Yes, I'm, I'm still voting. All right, Ernie asked me the other day to put together a presentation on how to communicate using uh, radio. And the, the situation that was described uh, was more akin to, you know, if you don't have the internet and you don't have telephones, how do you communicate? Next slide, please. So the hypothetical situation is somehow or another the, uh, the government in Ouagadougou, uh, formerly in uh, Mali, formerly known as Upper Volta, has figured out a way to destabilize the Western uh, societies. And so the United States, as we know it, has collapsed. Uh, the normal infrastructure that we have has ceased working, making our communications by cell phone or landline impossible for whatever reason. Next slide. So the, the question is, how do you communicate with others? There are a variety of different ways you all know. You can communicate in person like doing here. Uh, there are obvious issues with regards to that in terms of proximity. Um, also, there can be some security issues, as a certain former leader of Al-Qaeda has figured out, that uh, some couriers are not always to be trusted. So you've got the trust and then the geography. His couriers actually were to be trusted, just one of them got rolled up via some intelligence that happened. They tracked him down, figured out that he was you know, staying in Pakistan about a stone's throw from the U their, their version of the U.S. Military Academy, and they claimed they didn't know. Um, Semaphore, from a distance, if you really like flags and you were you know, in cheer or something like that in high school, that might be a, a way to do it. Uh, used for a number of years, uh, especially in the military, also between ships. And then what we're here to talk about, though, is radio. Next slide. So you need to communicate. There are uh, some issues you need to think about is who do you want to communicate with? With the telephone, it's real easy. You have a number associated with a person. You pick up the phone, dial the number, Hopefully they're there, or their um, voicemail picks up and you can say hi to them or whatever it is you need to do. Uh, with radio, it's a little bit different because it's not a directed uh, communication in that there's no way, I take that back, there are, but it's difficult, but there's no way to really pick up a phone or the equivalent of a phone, dial a number, and then speak to Alan Corwin on the radio. You know, I have to know, you know, is he listening at that time? Are we on the same frequency? Um, are we even on, you know, the same type of radio? What distance do we need to communicate with? Uh, from is Alan across town or is he in Kansas? Does he want to talk to you? <laughs> Alan always wants to talk to me. Uh, so then you get the whole issue with scheduling. Uh, you know, you may remember in m many of the old military movies, they'll say, "Okay, at the top of every hour, check in." So they'll hop on the radio and check in with the you know, headquarters. Uh, so there's a scheduling issue as well, and then the method. There are a variety of different radio methods. One of which Ernie talked about, which I won't be talking about because it's not and I don't don't know anything about it, which was the uh, packet radio. Uh, I understand the basic concept. I've never used it, although I know people who have. And it, if, every, if the stars align and you know what you're doing, it can work. Next. 
So you're a ham? Yeah. So you, you know exactly what I'm saying. Um, so you have your, your various distances. You've got local, mid, and long distance communications. And for the sake of this, um, uh, of this, this talk, local is about zero to 35 miles. Mid distance would be about 35 to 800 and long distance 800 or more. Uh, again, the scheduling issue, um, you might, if you decide that you set up a radio system, have a certain schedule that you uh, connect with, you know, okay, at, the, at noon every day, I will be listening on this frequency, and you can have a, a certain number of frequencies that you can rotate through if you're looking for security, but that's beyond the scope of this, this discussion. Next, please. So short distance, zero to 35 miles. Most everybody is familiar with the little handheld radios like I'm sorry, what was your name, sir? Oh. My name's Richard, this is Karen. So she's, she has a small, this happens to be a ham, uh, ham radio um, without its antenna. It's a FT60, which is a, I believe a dual band. Is it a dual band? So. Yeah, so when we, uh, hams talk about bands, they're talking about different frequency uh, allocations. Um, so, many of your short distance communications tend to be using this type of radio or something similar within your vehicle, mobile radio. Usually within the FM mode, you know the difference between AM radios uh, that you listen to and FM radio. FM comes in real clear because that, um, without getting real technical because even I still have problems with it, it's a different way that it, it ends up transmitting. Radio, as you know, you're driving down the highway, you'll get you know, bleed over from other stations. Uh, some will fade in, some will fade out. Generally speaking, not always, but generally speaking with FM radios like this, it's either on or it's off. You can either hear them or you can't. It might be a little bit staticky, might cut in and out a little bit, but it's, uh, you know, it's kind of a all or nothing type of, of thing. Um, it's line of sight, meaning that even though you may not literally be able to see them, you have to, there has to be a line of sight between the two. So I can't talk on this radio. I could not talk to somebody in Kansas. Um, I could talk to somebody probably up to about five miles away, given the right antennas and, and uh, geography and terrain and, and buildings involved. Um, but there, it has to do with the way that the frequency allocation and then also the, the method of the mode of, uh, of the transmission FM. So handy talkies like this are real convenient. You can carry them around. They cost anywhere between 75 to three or four hundred dollars, depending on what bells and whistles you want with it. Um, they can last six to eight hours on a battery charge. You can get battery packs that will use AA batteries. So it's pretty convenient for an emergency situation. Um, you, AA batteries are pretty much available anywhere in any gas station. In your vehicle, they have mobile radios, which if you think of the radios that uh, uh, police cars have, they'll put out more power. Usually this will be about five watts, sometimes less. Uh, you can also alter these. Uh, the uh, Vehicle-based radios can go anywhere from about 50 watts all the way up to 75 watts in some cases. Uh, uh, is that your? That's out of my car. Okay. Yeah, this is a it's a radio that runs 50. Well, I guess it's 75 watts. This is called a faceplate. It sits on my dashboard, and then the, it has a cord to the main radio that stands under my seat. And here's the microphone, and it's very unobtrusive, very compact. This has dual bands too, and on the back of the car. Right. How much is that? What's the range of it? Uh, well, the range is, I mean, what we do is on two, uh, these frequencies, we go through what's called repeaters. So on South Mountain and on the White Tanks, there are amateur maintained radio stations that pick up my rather weak signal and rebroadcast it all over. I can go all over the valley. Right. So th think of it kind of as a cell phone tower for ham radios. Um, but again, you're, you're dependent on that system. Usually they're owned by clubs. Uh, or private individuals who spend their own time and money to maintain it. Um, they have often will have backup battery power, which will last a couple of days. Yes? When I was younger, the ham radios had to be licensed for something which was beyond me. You got to memorize this, memorize that. How about now? I'll, that in a little, yeah. I'll get that in a little bit, but... I'm just going to do questions at the end. Yeah. Only I get to ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you need to get a short distance from 0 to 35 miles. How do you do that? Well, a lot of you folks know about the FRS radios. There are actually two different ones, FRS, which is Family Radio Service, and the GRS, GMRS, which I believe is a General Mobile Radio Service. And those are roughly in the same frequency area, about the 460 megahertz thing. 
think of it as the newest version uh, of uh, CB radio, only in the FM uh, thing. So you have a short range communication um, between two individuals. GMRS technically requires a license, but I don't think I've ever heard of anybody ever getting prosecuted using a GMRS radio without a license. So it's, in essence, they've become the new CB radio um, for, uh, for radio communications. When you buy one, it's got no application, no information on how to get one, a couple of lines that scare you that say you need a license, and just 22 channels and you pick one and you don't even know what you're on. Right, yeah, next slide. The short distance, the FRM, FRS, GMRS radios, as Alan said, you pick a channel. Um, these are, are fixed, if you will, fixed channels, fixed frequency radios. So you'll select a channel from 1 to 22, and then there are what they call subtones. Uh, Motorola likes to call them privacy lines uh, that go from uh, number 0 to 38. Doesn't mean a whole lot to you unless you've studied this whole this stuff, and it's even confusing to me at times. But basically, you don't have the ability to ch pick any frequency you want. So obviously, anybody else who has this type of radio can scan through the frequencies and very easily pick up what you might be saying or not. Um, it does make it convenient though for people who don't use radios a lot to just say, go to channel 12. And that's pretty easy for people to, people to do. Um, they're not secure, even though Motorola calls them privacy lines. Basically what it does is, if I select privacy code five, for example, what it does is it tunes out everybody else you can't hear them, but anybody who doesn't have any of those numbers activated, if you're on channel, for example, 12, uh, code zero, meaning no code, I can hear everybody that's uh, transmitting on channel 12, even though they may not be able to hear me. So there's the whole security issue. Again, GMRS technically requires a, a license. Uh, nobody gets one. I don't know anybody who's got one even. Uh, they're low power. The FRS radios uh, are 0.5 watts, which doesn't sound like a whole lot, but you can actually get a reasonable distance, up to about a mile or so, two miles, maybe in good conditions, for an FRS radio. Um, GMRS can go up to about two watts. And the GMRS radios, if you can still find them, you can add different antennas and, and they have GMRS repeaters uh, and they have actual mobile units as well too. So there's a little bit more flexibility in the GMRS range uh, versus the FRS. Um, the realistic distance for those, zero to two miles for the FRS and about maybe five miles under really good conditions for the GMRS system. Next slide. Ham radio. I am a licensed ham, so I need to tell you uh, from an ethical and moral standpoint that in order to operate on the ham frequency allocations, you do need to have a ham radio license issued by the government and the FCC. Ethical and moral government? Yeah, because, no, no. <laughs> Me? Be cynical? Never. Um, so I cannot advise you to buy a ham radio and use it outside because they actually do prosecute for that. They do. Very hard, and I mean, tens of thousands of dollars in fines for people who are caught unlicensed broad or not broadcasting, transmitting. Um, the license so, for ham and for the GMRS are, are, different. are different, right? And what is the requirement? How much for the, uh, for the for the GMRS? Technically, it's I think about eighty bucks, and it's good forever. Um, but again, nobody gets it. I've never. No, it, it's just it's CB. When you, you bet, may, way back in the way way back time, you had to get a call sign for uh, your CB license, and it was basically your initials and your zip code. But you had to send in a form and a and forty dollars or whatever it was to the government. It's the same type of thing for GMRS. Uh, but again, just like CB, nobody did it. Everybody bought one. Everybody used it, and the government decided, oh, we can't do anything about it really realistically anyway. Same thing has happened with GMRS radios. So. Um, at, at this time, FRS and GMRS radios are, for all intents and purposes, license-free. Um, ham radio is not. So, um, one of the reasons why they have done that is that, for example, the, the if you will, channelized versions of the FRS and GMRS radios is to make sure that people who don't know what they're doing don't transmit out of the frequency allocation. In, Two meter ham radio, we have from 144 to 150 megahertz range. Uh, we can transmit anywhere between that. Because of that, we have the ability, ham ra radios have the ability to pretty much go to any frequency within that and not be specifically tied to a channel, channel 22, which might be 460 something something megahertz on FRS. Um, 
So with that is sort of a responsibility training, whatever, to make sure that you don't transmit out of your allocated band. Most of the radios do come locked down now so that even if you wanted to, you couldn't transmit at 150 megahertz, for example. There are ways around that in terms of modifying radios. Some of the uh, radio manufacturers are getting a little bit craftier in terms of how to try and, and prevent that. And of course, just like with every other technology uh, war, you got guys who say, well, if you want to try and put some restriction on me, I'll try and figure a way around it. So there are often software methods and hardware methods going into resistors or jumpers or whatever that you can open radios up. Again, even if I were to do that and transmit outside of my uh, allocated frequencies within two meter ham radio, I can get into a lot of trouble. However, you know, if you're... What's the I don't because the, the frequencies are often allocated to other agencies such, such as public service or uh, private uh, licensees. Uh, taxi, uh, you know, in the land mobile radio service, for example, a lot of taxi companies and construction companies will get uh, purchase, if you will, the rights to use a, a particular frequency. And by altering a radio and transmitting on there, I then interfere with their communications that they've paid a feed for. So, it's like driving the wrong way on the highway. <laughs> so, um, again, licenses are required and enforced. So, I can't recommend that you do that. You know, do so at your own risk. Um, and what uh, he had talked about with regards to re re repeaters, again, cell phone towers for radios um, have a small half watt radio, hit a repeater down at uh, South Mountain, and then through the magic of electronics, that gets re uh, retransmitted out, and I could probably talk to somebody down in perhaps Casa Grande if, you know, with, with the conditions right now, the right radio. So there are ways to link repeaters so that a repeater from South Mountain is linked up to a repeater in Flagstaff. So if I set it up correctly, I can talk to somebody in Flagstaff on this. So if the repeaters are working, and the assumption under this is that for whatever reason, the repeaters aren't working, either they've been taken down, the power's out, whatever, so we don't have repeaters. Uh, let's see, antennas are very important within the context of radio communication. The better the antenna, the better the signal you'll get out, and that's actually even sometimes more important than the amount of power that you have transmitted out of here. For every X number of decibels increasing gain in your antenna, which is this whole technical that you study and learn, um, you actually have the effect of doubling, as if you've doubled the power from five watts to 10 watts. So with a really good antenna, you can often communicate just as well or better than if you had a crummy antenna and a whole lot more power behind it. Next slide. Land mobile, as I mentioned, um, is another UHF, uh, generally frequency allocation. Companies will pay for, for the rights to use a particular frequency or set of frequencies. Um, these are similar in um, context to the FRS, FRS and GMRS radios in that they're channelized. There are certain frequencies that you have to program into the radio, so they have a little bit more flexibility than an FRS radio in that I can choose um, whatever frequencies I want to transmit on and then program that into the radio, but it's not field programmable. So if I need to change frequencies and talk to somebody on a frequency that I don't have programmed into my land mobile radio, that's not gonna happen as well. So again, it's to try and make it as foolproof um, out in the field so that you don't transmit on frequencies you're not technically authorized to transmit. But this was the type of radio that we used um, when I was doing search and rescue, we had the national, state search and rescue frequencies, several of the law enforcement frequencies, and our own uh, private frequency that one of the uh, one of the members had uh, gotten an authorization to use for this. Um, again, if we had transmitted on one of the law enforcement frequencies without authorization from them, we'd have gotten in a lot of trouble. Um, next, oh, I'm sorry, wait, marine radios. In an emergency, you need to communicate with whomever you need, uh, can, however you can. I have heard, but I've never been able to find, that marine radios, like you would use on your boat, are legal in the continental if you are over a certain distance from a navigable land uh, body of water. Uh, how that's defined, I don't know. So the Mississippi would be one, probably. Lake Pleasant would be another one. However, the government decides they'd want to define uh, a navigable body of water, supposedly, again, I've never found it, that, that you can use that. It's, there are only a handful of frequencies that boaters use, 
but I know that there are um, certain groups that I know of that have decided to use uh, marine radios as their basis of communication, uh, mostly because it's got reasonably good power, got a lot of antenna options, and it's not as common as some other uh, radio systems might be for you know, people to use. Next. Just as in computers, nobody got fired buying IBM. There are certain brands within uh, the radio uh, world that tend to be used and, and purchased than others. A lot of it has to do with slick marketing and, and really nice graphics. But uh, Motorola, Kenwood, Maxon are, were decent. Uh, Midland also for the FRS and GMRS radios. Um, you can pick these up pretty much at any, yeah, heck, I think even Fry's Food and Drug carries FRS radios now. But you can get them in, sometimes in three, four packs. Uh, the one thing to, to realize is that when it says, you know, range up to 36 miles, <laughs> yeah, good luck with that. That's if somebody's standing on a, a top of a building 36 miles away in an open field and there's no other, uh, no other interference. It's, it's very pie in the sky. Theoretically, it's possible because it's line of sight. Is it actually going to happen? Are you going to be able to talk from here to Scottsdale Air Park on an FRS radio? No, you're not going to. Um, a ham radio would be difficult to do um, unless you were using a, a mobile-based one pushing about 50 watts into a really good antenna. Okay. Ham, Yesu, Vertex, kind of the same company. One, Vertex is their more commercial line. Uh, Icom, Kenwood, Alinko, um, and then Vertex and Icom in, in Land Mobile. Those are probably going to be your top brands. Uh, there are some off brands that get uh, get get imported. There's a, a Chinese one that uh, called Wuxian, I think, uh, W O U X O N, which apparently is doing okay and is re reasonably priced. But you can pick up kind of an older version of the two meter only one, the FT 110, I believe it was. There, if you could, you can find them on eBay for like for less than a hundred bucks. Next slide. So. Short distance across town, you figured out that, okay, we've got an FM radio in my car, uh, I've got a reasonably good antenna, I can talk uh, you know, across town because of the whole line of sight thing, but I need to talk to somebody in Kansas. You know, my mom's in Kansas, I wanna see how she's, she's doing, and gosh, she was a ham radio for a long, for, you know, for, uh, for a time, and so we're gonna set up a, a station and, and talk to my mom. Um, well, remember CB radio? CB radio is in the high frequency range, which goes from about two megahertz to 30 megahertz in the 27 megahertz band um, on good days and under the right conditions you may remember what they called skip you'd be talking on your CB to somebody across town and next thing you know you'd hear somebody out of San Luis Obispo California and that has to do with how um, the signal bounces off the the atmosphere the ionosphere um, the uh, power output for CBs is 4 watts for normal 12 watts for what they called single sideband if you think of a frequency um, as being this part, the main frequency would be right in the middle, and what they'd call upper and lower side band would be part of the upper half of that, that range and part of the lower. So if you think of the old um, CBs or AM radio stations, those were a very wide called bandwidth. And so you'd have, you know, on your CBs, you'd hear somebody who was close to you on another channel bleed over and that has to do with the, the power output and the bandwidth. Um, next slide. So AM is very wide bandwidth, uh, single sideband, very narrow, and you can get a lot better signal out, and with CBs, be able to push a little bit more power. Is that how when you're listening to the radio, it has like the song and so on in the new, they put extra information in there? Um, no, Ernie's question was, you know, if you're watching or listening to the radio and it scrolls by with the song and all of that, um, to be honest, I don't know how that works. It's, uh, it's probably a subcarrier of some sort that's within the signal that uh, is decoded by the radio. So, uh, yes, it's not it's not the same thing. So new radios now, when you're listening to it, like 93.3 KDKB on your radio, on the LED it says KDKB Queen, uh, wherever the song is, the information of what you're listening to. Yeah, and but it's not not quite the same thing. So if you think of Again, bandwidth being this wide, single side band would be the upper, perhaps the upper half uh, of that, that entire bandwidth. So you get a bit cleaner signal. You can then fit two signals within that same bandwidth, one person using upper, one person using lower side band. All right. Um, 
Now comes to the, to the fun part that a lot of hams uh, really, really like, which is theory. Uh, I'm going to get not, I'm, I tried to keep this as untechnical as possible, and I apologize if it's, it's still confusing. It's just, I don't know, it's, it, it, yeah. Anyway. We're Americans, complicated okay. Okay, so for long distance communications, what ends up happening is that the signal uh, bounces up into the ionosphere, and due to ionization caused by the sun and the wind and the planets aligning, it bounces back down. And it continues, it can continue to bounce back and forth between the, uh, the earth and the ionosphere until it reaches what you, uh, where you're trying to, to uh, communicate with. Some frequencies such as those in the 150, 140 megahertz range, they'll never bounce. You shoot them up into the sky, they'll just keep going. That's one of the reasons why um, long distance communications with these is practically impossible because you can't get any sort of distance beyond the theoretical curvature of the earth. If you shoot a, a straight line, once it hits that, that edge of the earth, it's done. And so theoretically you could get, you know, maybe 100 miles or so out of it if, you, if the uh, winds, you know, were behind you and it was pushing in the direction that you wanted it to go. Uh, I'm facetious there too. Um, <laughs> within high frequency communications, um, they have what they call the maximum usable frequency, which is the highest frequency at that particular time that you can use to have reliable um, long distance communications. That will vary by time of day, which then uh, changes the frequency. At night, with the uh, sun going away, the ionosphere is deionized, and therefore the lower frequencies um, will have a much better chance of bouncing as the sun comes up, earth warms up, the atmosphere gets ionized, higher frequencies, and usually about between 2 and 15 megahertz are going to be your long distance communication frequencies. Occasionally you'll get um, sunspots and a bunch of other phenomena that will allow the, um, like the CB radio skip, It'll and also the 10 meter uh, frequencies, which is about 28 megahertz to 29 megahertz, just above CBs, that will allow that to um, propagate longer distances as well. But it's uh, unreliable and you can't count on it. If it happens, it's really kind of cool. You can be talking on you know, your little 10 meter radio and be talking to somebody in Kansas and it might last five minutes, it might last an hour. So you know, the, for reliable long distance communications, we're talking 15 megahertz and below. Next. And this is kind of a graphical representation of what I was talking about. As you can see the sky wave on the left, that's a, essentially what this would be if you had a directional antenna and tried to bounce it off the, uh, the ionosphere. Um, and then you see the, the sky wave where it bounces off the ionosphere, and then you have the skip zone. The skip zone is that dead uh, area between where the bounce is that you can't receive anything. So you've got the ground wave down below, which is how these operate. And you can see because of the curvature of the Earth, it has a theoretical limit that it can go. Um, so you've now decided, okay, I've got HF communication system set up, and I need to be able to communicate with my you know, mother in Kansas, um, but you know, I also want to communicate with a, a friend up in Utah. Well, perhaps you're in that skip zone, and now all of a sudden you can't communicate with them, even though you can communicate with people at longer distances. Next slide. So as I mentioned, you can, you know, these are the, uh, the positive things that uh, HF communications can do in terms of being able to communicate across the globe. The other thing is also you can push a lot more power legally with a ham radio. You can get amplifiers that'll uh, push up to 1500 watts, and if you get that and a directional antenna, it would be no problem at all for a guy in Arkansas to talk to somebody in uh, Japan, just like you and I are talking now under the right conditions. Next slide. So I mentioned the skip zone. How do you get into that? Well, there's this method of um, um, use called near vertical incident sky wave. And if you think about it um, in terms of like a dome or an umbrella, instead of having these try and propagate out towards the horizon and then bounce down, what you want to do is in essence shoot it straight up and then it comes down as, as a dome. Um, you can get from about 30 to 800 miles. The military used this a lot in World War II. Um, one of the great things about it is because it comes down like that, it's easy to use if you're communicating, as, like in valleys, you're in a bunch of uh, you know, mountainous terrain, 
you know, the FM radios won't work, you don't have satellite communications, there's no way to bend the signal over the top. So what you do is you shoot it straight up, comes down, and now all of a sudden, um, you know, you've got somebody 50 miles away in another valley, you can communicate with them. Um, this, again, the usable frequency is from two to 15 megahertz. One of the great things about Envis communications is that the antenna doesn't need to be real high. As a matter of fact, the lower it is, sometimes the better it is because as you lower an antenna, it doesn't pick up as many signals, stray signals from the outside. So you have less uh, atmospheric or other interference. And then also it tends to allow it to bounce more vertically than the higher you have it up, the more it wants to tend to go to the sides. The lower you have it, it kind of shoots it down and then straight back up. Next slide. So, again, a slightly different representation there, but you can see the bounce. That near vertical incident sky wave, what it's doing is it's coming down and it will continue to bounce up and down until it, it kind of runs out of steam, if you will, usually around the 800 to 1,000 mile mark. Next. And another way to do that, so you've got you know, the radios in the different valleys that would not be able to communicate via line of sight. They just bounce it off the ionosphere and next thing you know, everybody's able to, to receive. Next. The, the big thing that if you start to get into the uh, long distance communications, you know, HF radio stuff, is that it is as much alchemy as anything else. Um, people spend their entire lives trying to per make the perfect wave, if you will, of, of antennas, radios, and everything else to be able to communicate reliably over a long distance. And it's a lot as much theory as it is luck. And luck of the draw with regards to the frequency that you're using is somebody actually listening on that frequency. So again, that whole scheduling issue. Um, you know, the atmospheric conditions, sunspot, you know, again, the antenna, is it cut for the right frequency? Or are you trying to use an antenna that's too long or too short? Uh, for the optimal frequency that it's, that it's designed for. Um, so a couple of different antennas on your left, you'd have a very directional antenna that you could use something like that with this and get some significant distance because it, it shoots it like a, like a laser beam, if you will, as opposed to uh, transmitting it broadly. Um, the other one's a kind of a representation of an HF uh, antenna that somebody might put up between you know, something and a couple of radio towers. As you can see, the Directional antennas, maybe you can't, um, but there are directional antennas at the top there. Next. So how effective is the center line? You see how you're camping in mm -hmm. between two pine trees. You're right. Um, every year, the fourth weekend in June, uh, the AARRL, the Amateur Radio Relay League, sponsors a contest, if you will, called Field Day. And it was originally designed as a way for ham radio operators to get out in the field camping using their equipment off of uh, standard power. So there's a group that I go with that I uh, met uh, with Honeywell, and every year we've gone uh, for the last uh, seven, eight years, and we'll throw in some antennas up into the trees, and some guys will work uh, digital radio, such as the, kind of like the, the email thing. Um, and I've communicated with, I communicated with a woman in Australia on 14 megahertz at two o'clock in the morning. So was very active. Uh, I happened to be working that frequency and this woman came back with an accent, and I thought, oh, I wonder what part of the country she's in. You know, and I said, what's your call sign? I didn't recognize it, and the guy next to me said, oh, that's Australia. And so I asked her, are you in Australia? She said, yeah. And she didn't realize there was a contest going, and initially it was like, you know, okay, next contact, shut up, I wanna go on. And we just ended up starting to talk because there was nobody else on the frequency. So we ended up talking for about an hour, which uh, at, for that frequency range just was kind of astounding. It didn't, wasn't expected. Um, so, you know, they, it gives you an opportunity to go out into the field and use these things in less than ideal conditions, which would be obviously advantageous for the type of situation that we're talking about. Um, I've used um, a, what they call a dipole, which is two pieces of wire cut for a frequency slung up into the, uh, uh, into the trees. Another guy has used a, what they call a vertical, think of your old CB style antenna that was stuck down and through a bunch of uh, what they call radials um, to help the um, to help the signal get out, and he's talked to people you know all across country. So, you know, you've got issues with regards to you know how you're going to power your your equipment. You know, do you have the coax or other method of you know hooking your radio up to the antenna? How are you going to get the antenna into the uh, into the trees? Um, one guy built a, an air-powered tennis ball launcher 
that he had a fishing lure thing attached to. So he had a bunch of line on the, on the ground, or at, on a reel, attached to this PVC thing that he filled with hairspray, and set it up almost like an RPG, put the tennis ball in there, hit the uh, piezo igniter, boom, shot it up about 80 feet, and came down and was able to pull up his antenna. It was really kind of neat. And then he decided that having lighter fluid and a spark probably wasn't the safest. So the next year he went to a compressed air version and bought a high compression bicycle pump that he now has to lug around. And, and but think about it, you know, if you can't find lighter fluid or some other flammable liquid, you know, if you have your bicycle pump, you can launch a tennis ball. So yeah, a lot of people will use a slingshot. They actually make now uh, the heavy duty slingshots with a uh, fishing reel attached to it so that you have your, your, your two ounce weight or half ounce weight or whatever, and you've got the uh, fishing line to it, shoot it up into the thing, it unreels, you attach your antenna line to it, pull it back up, and up you go. Can we stay with the telephone? I, yeah, yeah it'd, it'd be great. What, what I have found in terms of some other folks that I've talked to are like, going, oh, you know, when, 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 the, when the feces hit the oscillator, I want to be able to talk to people. Well, who do you want to, who do you want to talk to? Well, my friends. Well, where are they? Well, I've got one in Oregon, I've got a couple in Scottsdale, and I want to talk to my mom in Mesa. Well, how do you plan on doing that? Well, I don't know. That's why I'm asking you. Well, that's kind of where this whole thing came on. They're like, well, you don't have just something that you can pick up and, and I say, yeah, it's called a telephone. And what, what I found that most people seem to want is the convenience, portability, and usability of a telephone that doesn't use the telephone system. And unfortunately, that doesn't exist unless you want to call a satellite phone. But again, that's something that the government can flip on and off as well and also cost a lot to use. So. Uh, next slide. Again, some some of the same brands as before. Um, next, military backpack radios. These can be really fun. Yeah, the PRC 77, for, uh, affectionately known as the Prick 77. Um, that is a, a VHF radio that operates between 30 and 88 megahertz. So within the six meter band. And uh, there are a lot of uh, ham radio operators that have those that work between 50 and 54 megahertz, which is six meters. But they're, you know, they're about 15 pounds without a battery. Um, batteries don't have a whole lot. And because of <clears throat> the uh, squelch system, which makes it, uh, you know, if you remember the CB radios, you know, if you turn down the squelch, all you'd hear is, you know, you turn that up and it goes away and it's nice and quiet until somebody calls. The squelch system in a PRC-77 is a sub-audible tone similar to the privacy codes I was telling you about where the FRS, FRS radios, but that is 150 hertz, and no commercial radio that I know has 150 hertz as a selectable tone. So the only people who can use a PRIC-77 is with somebody else who's got a PRIC-77 or similar radio. So while they're fun and they're kind of cool, they're not real practical for uh, post-apocalyptic communications. Um, when you get into the HF radios, for military backpacks, because they do make them. You know, they'll be about this big. Um, some of them are smaller. I've got a, a small one, um, weighs about seven pounds, uh, but it's got its limitations as well. But the military ones, they're gonna weigh 15 tons without the battery, just, just the radio. So you start carrying a battery or a couple batteries, or in the case of, of a, uh, uh, the British uh, PRC-320, the little hand crank generator to recharge the battery. You know, you're going to start getting into 20, 25, 30 pounds of radio stuff when you start including um, you know, the antenna, the cables, any other accessories as well. They're hard to repair if you don't have the right equipment or the modules. Some of them are kind of plug and play. Pull out one module because it's bad, you plug in a new module. Uh, there's really no repair of the different modules. Um, and then mostly, uh, battery availability is a huge issue. Most of the uh, ham radio operators that use these they build their own battery boxes using rechargeable batteries. So that is an option, but in, in, there's some complications. You gotta kinda know what you're doing. Some people sell them commercially, but they're gonna be really expensive, really heavy as well. So, next. So, a couple of examples. The PRC-104, which was the most recent version, well, I hate to say that just because the military has used a lot of versions. PRC-138 is probably the most recent, recent version of the HS. And a lot of it has to do with you know, the, um, the circuitry inside, how it operates, and a bunch of other things. So again, these are going to be um, you know, fairly expensive. The one down at the bottom, the PRC-1099, one of the great things about that is that works off of 12 volts. 
most of the other military radios will work off of 20 volt, 24 volts. Um, and the small backpack radio that I've got works off of 24 volts as well. So, you know, if you can find them for a reasonable price, the PRC 1099 is not a bad radio. Um, you can use your standard, you know, D cell batteries in a, in a commercially available battery box. These were real big with the uh, McMurdo station uh, expeditions down there because they're easily repaired. They don't require a whole lot of power and were, were really reliable. <clears throat> At the moment, um, PRC 104, if you can find them, are probably going to be about $1,400. The PRC 2000, if you can find it, is probably going to be 19 to 2400. The PRC 138, which I didn't list up here, is probably closer to 5000. Um, that does a whole lot of things that this one, these don't though. They will work in, in bands outside of, uh, outside of your standard uh, zero to, or two to 30 megahertz. The best value of these at the moment is probably going to be the PRC 320. Um, it's a British radio, also known as the Klansman series of radios. Um, you can pick them up, well, when I was looking at them, uh, you could get it imported with pretty much everything that was ever built for it for about $1,000 to $1,200. So if you, you feel you have to have a military radio, um, you know, that's probably the, the one to get. The, they're very frequency agile, meaning they will transmit on any frequency between two and 29.99 megahertz. Um, problem is that you see all these little dials and buttons, it scrolls through each one. So it's not like you can spin to a certain frequency. You have to set it. The dials there on the PRC320 when I was trying to use it for Ham Radio Field Day about three years ago, um, my fingers got worn because they're very strong clicks so that it doesn't get uh, knocked off frequency if you're you know, supposed to be uh, communicating with you know, your, your military headquarters. So I would go all the way around and it doesn't go through, so I'd have to go all the way around to nine, flip it back to zero, take the next one, increment it one, go up, and that's how I scrolled through all the different channels. So these aren't really for perusing channels. These are for, I know a particular frequency I have to be on at a particular time with a particular person. You dial in that frequency and there you go. Um, but, you know, they're robust. They're almost all waterproof um, to a degree. Um, but again, they're heavy and, you know, for a reason. What about encryption? Encryption? Within the ham radio spectrum, it's illegal to encrypt communications. For some of these radios, encryption modules are probably available. Um, I don't, I know that the PRC-104 and the 2000 have encryption capability. I don't know how it does. It's, it's probably a module that gets inserted inside the circuitry somewhere and or loaded up between the, uh, uh, the microphone and the radio itself, and so you dial in whatever frequency. Um, I've not seen those on the commercial market. They're obviously a controlled item. Um, you know, it is available, but I think a, if you're looking to try and keep people from listening, um, the best Oakham's razor usually uh, fits here is don't rely on technology, rely on something else and do like the Navajo did in World War II, come up with a code of some sort. Um, within the ham radio band, it's also illegal to you know, discuss, uh, talk in encoded uh, transmissions. I just have to say that. Really? But you could talk in that language. There's no, there's no, um, no prohibition against foreign languages on it, but if you, it, yeah, I mean, as, as I, I, I don't know, I don't know of anything that says it has to be in English because, you know, as long as it's, if somebody who understands the language can, can understand what you're saying, then then technically it's it's okay. But if you're using Klingon to talk, you know, in Navajo code talk about, you know, a, a pineapple is a grenade and a turtle is a tank kind of thing, that would be illegal. But if you called a tank a tank in Klingon with somebody else who spoke Klingon, as far as I know, you're golden. So everybody learn Klingon. <laughs> You're, it's, it's absolutely true. The, the, pro, the problem that you've got, and, and he brings up a valid point, you know, if, if the governments collapse, who's going to enforce all this stuff? Nobody. At least not in the short term. You know, again, the communications laws are such that if I break my leg in the, in the middle of the desert and the only frequency I have available is a police frequency, 
Legally, I can use it to call for help. Am I going to get in trouble? Probably until I can, you know, act, you know, I have to be dying. A broken leg is probably not going to be enough, but, you know, I lost a limb and I'm bleeding out. Yeah, I could probably get away with calling on Pinal County's, you know, uh, dispatch frequency going, hello, I've fallen and I can't get up, uh, and not get into a whole lot of trouble. You know, they, I'd probably get smacked around for a while uh, and they don't do that again, and, and that'd be probably the end of it. Well, who's doing that? Right now, the government, FCC, but a post apocalyptic you know, government, you know, Mali's destabilized the West, the government collapses, nobody's going to be. The problem that you're going to have, though, talking about encryption, people, you need, people you're going to talk to have to have encryption as well. They have to know how to use it. All of this stuff is really nice if you know how to use it. You know, it, it would be similar to saying, okay, we're going to have this thing called the Internet, but you have to get licensed to use it right now, but we don't want to get licensed, so we don't want to get in trouble, we're not going to use it, but we've got it. And all of a sudden, now things go south. You decide, okay, let's get on the internet. And somebody goes, oh, how do you do that? It's the same type of thing with ham radio, especially long distance communications. It's not plug and play. You have to have a good idea of you know, how the signal propagates, the time of day, the frequency. Do you have a good antenna? Um, so you know, there's nothing saying that you can't go to ham radio outlet at 43rd and Dunlap and get some of the, and even online, you can find a lot of the, the radio theory for free. Um, and study for all that stuff and never take the test, but you know it. You know how to do that. Get, you know, to, know every ham in your neighborhood. get to know every ham in your neighborhood. So I watch what you do. This is really interesting. And ask questions. Well, gosh, if I wanted to talk to that person in Japan, but I didn't have you know, uh, a way to plug my radio in, how could I do that? Well, then you talk about deep cycle batteries and an inverter. Well, how do you, how do you keep the deep cycle batteries charged? Oh, you, know, you have a, a solar cell you know, that you throw out in the backyard with a little voltage regulator so you don't overcharge it and that keeps the battery topped off and you know so there's there's a lot to a lot to think about when you're doing this. Can you buy this equipment? Oh, I'm sorry. Can you buy this equipment when you're not a hand operator? Like I'm not a hand, would I be able to go there and get it or do they say what your call sign is or whatever that's about? Like they, they will ask you your call sign? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Store policy they might not sell, but all this stuff's available on the internet. Um, there are a couple of companies um, AESham.com, I think it is, hamcity.com as well. Um, they're, they're mail order companies. So you know, if you know what you want, mail it in. They might ask for it and say, oh, well, I'm, I'm studying to take the test. You know, as long as you don't transmit on it, there's no, there's no log. It's anybody owning one of these until they hit the transmit button. And, and the same thing with the HF radios as well. You can have any of these, any of the commercial versions. Not a problem until you hit the transmit button and not, ha and not be licensed. Um, the one thing with FM radios, they're very easily found, uh, direction find, found, if you will. You get the right antenna, and within a certain amount of time, somebody can find you pretty easily through triangulation, a couple of people. Um, the old Prick 77s, they had actually extension cables for the operators so that they could put the radio up on a hill and the guy down at the bottom of the hill, because as soon as he hit the transmit button on the mic, the enemy knew where he was, and all of a sudden, guess where those next missiles went? To the top of that hill and blew the, blew the radio up. After losing a couple of guys, they thought, we better figure a way to, around that. Speaking of the military concerns there, I mean, this radio shit's real fast. The first thing you do in an operation is go to the radio transmissions. Why wouldn't they, they're going to turn off the internet. Why don't they just throw out sand out there and kill all the private ladies? You would have to have probably a huge EM signal to be able to do that, and some of the radios are still going to survive that. It's un unlike the internet, which is actually connected and has to go through central hubs or whatever. Radio just goes through the air. So unless you have a way to be able to overload the circuitry within this radio and destroy it. Oh, just going after everybody? There would be nothing to prevent them from doing that. Yeah. That, that can be done. It's more easily done in this frequency range because of the way that it, it transmits. Um, the HF radio, because it bounces and all of that, is a lot more difficult to find because there's no direction that the signal is coming from, unlike one of these. So theoretically, is it possible for them to jam? Yes, absolutely. What about an electromagnetic pulse? Would that just wipe out all of this stuff? Or is anybody hard to I don't know that anybody really knows the answer to that. I mean, there are, there are theories that, you know, the nuke goes off or the EM bomb goes off a couple hundred miles in the sky, and it sends out a blanket of electromagnetic energy that fries all the circuitry. Yeah. 
So theoretically, yeah, relatively push and play or your FRM, FRS and GMRS or land mobile that gets programmed. Um, those are realistically push and play. You know, you turn it, put the batteries in, turn it on, turn it to a channel, transmit, and if your friend or whoever you want to talk to is on that same channel, you know, and you're within the right range and everything, boom, you're golden. Can this crossover, can you have to where you're going up and umbrellas, but in a frequency with a stronger signal that would go to the... Uh, using a number, you, there's a thing called a transverter that does that. Very sophisticated piece of equipment that very few people have because it's difficult to get to operate. But what it will do is um, there, you can use this to talk to somebody, for example, in the 10 meter frequency, 28 megahertz, and vice versa. It's usually limited to a one band uh, coming in and one band going back out. So it's theoretical. Um, I've never used one. I've never been on one. I don't know how they operate. I know that they exist. Yes. And then, Mm -hmm. How would you do that? Look for the big antenna towers. Yes, there there actually is a list. Um, if you if you knew my call sign, you could look it up and find out exactly where I live, which is why I didn't give you my call sign. But there's there's there, there's I don't trust anybody. Uh, there's there's no central list. There is at the FCC. I can't go, as far as I know, I can't go to the FCC and say, hey, give me all the hams in, in Phoenix. Um, it might be possible. I haven't really looked at these because I really don't care. Um, is, do they have that? Okay, yeah. So yeah, you can find it on just like ham radio operators, Phoenix, Arizona, or zip code. Um, you could probably find a, a method to be able to do that. Um, so yeah, the other thing, look for the tall towers. If you're in a covenant restricted HOA thing, you know, most people have gotten a little bit stealth and stuffed uh, antennas up in the attics like I have. Yes? Um, two things, you could use a scanner for frequency, for FM short range communications, your typical police. A lot of the police departments, especially the larger ones, Glendale, uh, Phoenix, have gone to digital communications. So the old scanners, even though you can program the frequency in, you won't get anything. So now they've come out with scanners, Uniden uh, has them, um, which will decode the digital signal. Um, but a lot of the older agencies, uh, or the less uh, financially well-off agencies still use an analog signal that you can pick up. I live in Glendale. Um, my two, three scanners that I've got will no longer uh, pick up Glendale signal because of that. Well, well, how about for HF, for the HF frequencies? No, for like worldwide. Worldwide, yep. Any of those radios that I that I showed up there would work. They major manufacturers also. Uh, make receive only versions of those. Uh, ICOM, it's going to start with an R for receive. Um, and you can get those for, I think you can get a, an HF receive, uh, radio, probably about five, six hundred dollars on new. Um, that's going to have you know, a lot of filtering capability, be able to narrow it, the bandwidth down so you can really pick out a signal. Um, but again, a good um, thing that's going to help with that is going to be a, a what they call a resonant antenna, an antenna that's cut for about the length that you want to uh, to listen to. It's less critical on receive than it is on uh, uh, on transmit, but it, it still can help. So if you know that you're gonna have, you know, wanna listen to the 14 megahertz range, for example, you can take an antenna, you know, if you have one like on a reel, for example, make it a little bit longer, a little bit shorter, whatever. But generally speaking, it's, it, you know, if you have a super long antenna, it'll pick up pretty much everything and then you can kind of play with filters and, and listen uh, on that. But they do make the receive only HF radios uh, a lot less expensive. You can probably find a lot of this stuff on eBay if you happen to trust it. Uh, Craigslist probably as well. Um, you can get to you know take a look at it, make sure it works. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it'll it'll go probably about 1.6 megahertz to 29.999 megahertz. Um, you know, and once you get above that, it gets into a different radio circuitry, so you end up needing a, se a separate radio for anything above 30 megahertz. No, nope. you can you can throw one up into a tree. Some some of them even will have just your standard telescopic whip. If you're outside, that'll work pretty well. If you're inside, 
um, just because of everything that's in a home and how it's built. You know, if you can get the antenna outside, the higher the antenna, the longer the antenna uh, for uh, receive is going to be better. But you know, if you're in an area you need to be a little bit stealthy, you just throw a small wire up into a tree and you know, 15, 20, 30 feet, um, and you should be good. I'm sorry. Don't they make new DX receivers for like 100 bucks? Oh yeah, I mean you can get the small. Uh, yeah, you can get uh, Sanjian, uh, S A N D E. Uh, they're coming out of Korea. They make some nice uh, shortwave radio sets. So that's what you're basically asking about. Um, they'll be yeah, a let little. Me, let me say something. If you're gonna tell people to do that with the antenna for safety's sake, please don't. You better put. A ground. Yes. Because I worked with the phone company. People would do that, and they don't have a ground on. It. Guess where that's going? And it's attracting light. Yeah, well, that's it. You know, if you're doing it on a permanent basis or during a storm, absolutely. Um, you know, he's talking about a lightning strike, um, you know, hitting the, the antenna. But if you're using a small antenna like that on a small radio that you're sitting next to uh, outside in a storm uh, and a lightning hits you, no ground is really going to help. <laughs> you're going to be the ground, path of least resistance. Yes. Can you talk about classes? Uh, yes. Within the ham radio spec uh, service, there are several classes of operators. One's called the technician, the general, and the... Uh, I don't think she means category, oh. she means learning classes. Oh. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, if you go to ARRL.net, it's the Amateur Radio Relay League. Um, they will have a link there that basically says how to become a ham. Um, and that will, you know, you can study online. It will give you some ideas of who teaches classes locally. Uh, call Ham Radio uh, Outlet here in Phoenix. Um, let me see if I've even got their number. A lot of Ham Radio clubs will offer classes too. Uh, they give them a try all the time. Yeah, and and most of mo most of the uh, Ham Radio instructors, what they, they call them Elmers. I have no idea how that uh, got started. Yeah, they they call the old guys who who and not so old guys, uh, who teach people, uh, they call them Elmers. Um, yeah, men, they're basically mentors. Um, they, bas they do it because they love radio and they want to see people get into radio. Ham Radio Outlet, um, their number here is 602-242-3515. And there's an old fashioned device that has no federal tracking called a book. <laughs> <laughs> you find anything you need to know about ham radio now. Yeah. <laughs> and I just encourage you, yeah, stay friends with your local ham radio operator. You see an antenna up, something like that. Uh, go meet him, say hello, especially if you're talking about what kind of receiver do you think I should get. He'll have all kinds of ideas. Yeah, there are ham radio fast like swap meets that go around. Yes, in the back. And you're not going to do it telling you from the police. Yeah. <laughs> yes. How useful are the old tube receiver transmitters? I'm sorry? How useful or unuseful are the old tube receiver transmitters? Do you have tubes? Yeah. Can you get tubes? I don't know. I'm saying I've got one that works. Yeah. If it, I mean, if it works, it, it, it's fine. Yeah. But again, just like, well, just like any of this stuff, if it, this in, it went out, I would have no, I have no clue how to fix it. Some of the, some of the more technical guys, I'm affectionate. Put your tubes. Put them yeah. on eBay. Yeah. I'm affectionately known as a user. Um, and not necessarily, some folks would argue whether or not I'm actually a real ham radio guy because the old ham radio folks, they build their own radios out of, you know, forks and a, and a spoon, you know, and, and power it with, you know, lemon juice and vinegar. I mean, they, they, there, there are some people who are just phenomenal about building stuff. I am not one of those people. I, I know how to work stuff. I can give you a pretty good idea of how it works. If this were my radio and it Fried. I would have no idea how to how to fix it. I just go get myself a new one. <coughs> I know what a meter is, but when you refer to meters and eleven meters and forty meters, that's not referring to the length of the. Uh, no, it well, well, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and and when you but you can when you cut an antenna, you can cut it to either half wave or quarter wave and so you get it's what they call resonant meaning that it matches the frequency it's just a lot shorter it's going to be less efficient than maybe a full wave antenna but in some ways a shorter wave antenna 
can have transmission characteristics that are actually better in terms of directionality um, and you know how how it sends the signal out. So yeah, when they talk about waves and meters and all that, they're talking about the physical length of the radio uh, the radio frequency wave. And this vertical antenna, about how much do they cost? The vertical to get in that blind spot. Built, uh, oh, the vertical incidence thing. You can go to Home Depot. You get uh, you get lamp cord. Cut it to the cut it to the half wavelength. You know, say it's say it's a you need a 60 foot 66 foot antenna for 20 meters. Cut it to 33 feet. Split it. Connect it to the OX, and you know stake it in the ground about 10 feet above the ground, and you've got a an Envis an Envis antenna. It doesn't have to be real sophisticated. There are guys who their whole challenge is to build something out of parts that they've got or parts that cost, you know, buck 95 kind of thing. And then there are guys like me who's like, I kind of understand that. I'll just go buy the damn thing that I know will actually work. I've tried building my own antenna. antenna. Um, I'm pretty good with dipoles because it's real simple. Measure, cut, connect. Um, but when you start getting into vertical antennas, you know, the ones that go straight up and down, they have, because of the whole length of the antenna, to make it resonant, they have what they call a coil. Think of a coil in your uh, the old alternators. So it's, you know, it, it's a, yeah. It resonates on two inches longer frequency and then 440 megahertz and the coil connects, disconnects this part of the antenna. So this part on a higher frequency and the whole antenna on the whole frequency. Yeah, so antenna theory is, is even more alchemy. So they, they have to be accurate within a quarter inch or something, right? Or something? Uh, well, it depends, again. On something like this, if you were trying to go, um, to do it, yeah, you probably want to get it you know as accurately as you can. With an HF frequency, you, most of the newer radios will have built-in internal antenna tuners that will, if it's close, it'll match it the rest of the. You'll lose a little bit of uh, of power output because of the matching, um, but you know it, it doesn't have to be as exact. So, but anyway, Ernie's telling me I need to wrap it up, which is good because my throat's starting to. So, any. <laughs> get Frank up here and as soon as you're ready. Some practical applications so you guys know what we've done. We have three FM transmitters that we would transmit on FM frequencies that you could listen to on your radio. Now, uh, Shelton maybe remember this and so on. We did this during the Levolution. I'll give you a practical application. We go on eBay and we would purchase from China or wherever. China was usually the cheapest. For one to three hundred dollars, you get up to five, even legal five, and I think uh, or three five, but they actually dial up like fifteen watts. When you go up to a home to buy, or you see, uh, you go to the movie theater and you want to listen on your radio to the. Excuse me for a moment. We'll be done in just a second. <laughs> When you go to the movie theater, the drive-in, you'll see, you know, you just turn in your radio and you can listen to what, you know, the movie is. If you go to a home and it says tune in to FM, blah, 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 or it's AM for airport news, or you have a billboard that's a Cadillac, whatever, while you're sitting there at the traffic light, you can turn in that frequency and listen to the commercial. How that's done is legally through FM transmission, some AM, but FM transmission at a lower frequent uh, power, you can legally transmit a radio signal. So if you're in your neighborhood for a block or two, you can, you know, I had a, a friend when I first started doing radio, Jason Ovenshine in Tucson, put an antenna up at his house in his whole neighborhood, and he's sending out flyers, listen to this radio show on their FM transmitter. How we did that it was an idea that we went and we got these three transmitters. We would give them to college students in their dorm room, and they were looping tapes of Ron Paul speaking about whatever, putting a frequency, listen to 97.3 FM Ron Paul radio or whatever, and if you're at the university of what you call it, and the guy's walking around, they tune in, they're jogging the FM transmitter and listening to this loop tape of Ron Paul. This happens now. You can have a bunch of people all over the valley with their FM transmitter from their house with a signal coming off the internet and transmit all over the valley to a bunch of people everywhere right now with a frequency on billboards, on overpasses. So this is a lot of ways that you can use this. What we're talking about, in addition to being able to communicate, because we can do that now. The heck, I have them at home. When you do the antennas, you got to get it the right length. you got to have the coaxial cable right. Man, it's a real pain-in-the-butt tuning, and you get to learn a lot of this, and you can do it on the Internet. 
What he has shared with us is the just the understanding, not that we're, there's a test and we're going to remember everything, and the printout is up here. So those of you that are really interested, come get this. But there is the ability to communicate with other people when you have no other way of doing it. Thanks, Tim. Frank. I don't know, back in my day, you could legally transmit 100 milliwatts without a license. Is it still that way? Uh, that was years ago, so uh, you know, I don't know what it is now. Okay, we're going to give away two books and a map. The first book is um, 2368. 2368. Good, there you go. The, the books are back in the corner. Don and I found a whole, we meant to bring them today, but next month we're going to have a crap load more full books. <laughs> okay, second book. 2382. Bingo! Good Second book. Okay. okay. One of Alan's maps here for that's, this one. That's what I want. I read all the books. Three. Where is it here? 2377. 2377. The only person in here that can't use a damn thing. Well, pop, auction it off. You want to try it on? No, because that might change in a few months. <laughs> all right. Thank all of you for coming, and we'll see you a month from now.